Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. We're glad you're here with us. Um, thrilled to have you joining us today to learn more about the two FAFSA tools that are available to you to help your students complete the FAFSA. We're in the home stretch. It's almost April. Um, and then we get a, hopefully a wonderful summer. So um, as I said, we're, we're gonna be talking to you about the two FAFSA tools and giving, giving you an opportunity to see what's in each one. But let's start out with a poll just to get a sense of who's uh, joining us this morning so we can get to know who's with us. So are you a school counselor with a public school, with a private school? Are you a college advising core? Uh, advisor? Are you with a community-based organization or maybe you're with another type of organization? So who is with us? Let's give that one more second. Okay, so let's share your results. So it looks like most of you are with public schools, but we do have a private school member and some community-based organizations and, and some other partners. So great. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. Um, and I think I've got one more for you. Yep. So let's check in on how comfortable are you with helping students complete their FAFSA? You're a newbie. I can get them started. Or maybe you could be leading this webinar. Where are you on that spectrum? Give that one more second. Okay, so it looks like most of you feel reasonably comfortable getting students started. Some of you are newbies, and we have some really experienced people with us too. So that's great to see. Okay, so thanks for sharing. We will be um, pulling you again a little later, testing your knowledge as we go along. Now, just to, to help get you acclimated, um, and get to know some of the players behind the tools. Uh, NCSEAA, if you're not already familiar with us, is the state agency with the mission to help North Carolina pay for education. I am with them, Kathy Hastings McDonald, and I'm the associate director for outreach with them. So I'm your partner among with our CFNC reps to help uh, support you in your efforts in helping students complete their FAFSA. NCSEAA administers the secure report that we call Finish the FAFSA um, for high school staff and college access partners who work directly with students. We also collaborate with all kinds of um, education organizations, including College Foundation to provide CFNC.org, which is a free college access service for our citizens that have lots of great resources to help students plan for their future and the education they will need to get there. And then of course, to pay for it all. Now, My Future NC was the champion behind creating the original FAFSA tracker. SEAA is pleased to take on managing the FAFSA tracker that is now housed on the CFNC.org website. So both tools are now in one place, along with all the other resources and tools that are on the website. So if you haven't been there to check it out, I encourage you to do so. Now, I don't want to assume that everyone knows what we mean when we say FAFSA. So just to put it out there, FAFSA stands for the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. It's the application um, that students fill out to access aid, um, both from the federal level and um, at, the, at the state and, and college base level. They go to the studentaid.gov website if you haven't been there, um, lots of great resources there as well. But today we're gonna specifically focus on the FAFSA tools that you can use to help students in completing the form. Um, and just so you know, on the CFNC website, there is a pay section and under there, there's all kinds of great information, not only on how to help students complete a FAFSA, but on things like um, scholarships, there's a whole scholarship portal and um, videos that can help with um, understanding this process. But let's talk a little bit, we'll, we'll spend just a, a, a few minutes talking about why FAFSA is important and why it matters. Um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics updates this chart every year, but it tells the same story that education pays. The more you learn on average, the more you earn. So that's the left side or the blue bar side of um, the chart that you're seeing. Um, and FAFSA is a really important step in earning that more education 
beyond high school that helps you get that good paying job. But one of the things that people often don't recognize is that more education also builds economic resiliency. So you're far less likely to become unemployed or remain so. That's the green bars on the right side of the column. So students who continue their education not only earn more over their working lives, but they also build economic resiliency so that they can take care of their families in good times and bad. Sorry, just keeping an eye on the chat. Um, and uh, Catherine is my partner working behind the scenes, so Catherine, feel free to interrupt me if I if I need to answer anything along the way. Um, the other important thing for, for folks to realize is, you know, one of the things we saw back in 2008 is that we had a divided recovery. Those with higher education levels bounce back much sooner. That's the blue line that's zooming up uh, than those with lower levels of education. This was also true for the most recent pandemic-induced recession that we just endured. And what's interesting about this is that not all jobs that were cut due to the Great Recession came back even 10 years later. Uh, and lower skill jobs were the ones that were hardest hit. So 99% of job growth went to workers with, um, a high, with more than a high school education. Of the 11.6 million jobs that were created, 11.5 of them required some form of higher education. Only 80,000 new jobs went to workers with a high school diploma only. So, and, and the main driver behind this is technology and automation, where um, which disrupted many jobs. That's why it's important to help today's students prepare for tomorrow's jobs, because this trend is likely to continue. Jobs are going to keep changing as a result of technology and automation. Um, whoops, sorry, forgot I, I called those out for you. Okay, so as we know, FAFSA is an important step in um, helping to make affordability of education beyond high school a little more manageable. It unlocks access to financial aid to all those who qualify at the, at the federal, state, and at the college-based level. Um, unfortunately, the students who would benefit the most from completing the FAFSA are usually the ones least likely to, to complete it. The National College Attainment Network last year estimated that students in North Carolina alone left over $100 million on the table in unclaimed Pell Grants simply by not completing the form. That's money they would have qualified for that doesn't need to be paid back. So for many students, that can mean the difference between going to college or not. And, um, you know, I think we all see directly some reasons why students don't complete the FAFSA, but uh, this surprised me. This was a study done by the U.S. Department of Education, their National Center for Education Statistics. They asked folks why they didn't complete the FAFSA. And, um, you know, while we know there's a lot of reasons that won't be reflected in this data, 23% of students did not have enough information about how to complete a FAFSA. Again, so many of us feel like all we do is talk about FAFSA, so it's hard to believe that that's true, but, but a, one in four of your students are feeling like they don't have enough information. Students of color were more likely to feel this way, so 34% of Hispanic students and 27% of Black students versus 18% for white students. Now, these are national numbers. Um, the other interesting thing is that 15% did not know that they could complete a FAFSA. Again, this is surprising to me, but I have been hearing lately that there's some confusion where students don't think they need to complete a FAFSA if they're going to their local community college, for instance. Now, if they're going through a short-term program like a certified nursing assistant that's only six weeks long, that is true. You know, a, a FAFSA is not needed for something like that. But if they're pursuing a, an associate of science degree, the FAFSA absolutely will help and Pell Grants definitely apply to a program like that. And the, the final kind of surprising statistic was 9% thought the FAFSA was too much work or too time consuming. And while it, it is an investment of time, the amount of financial aid it opens the door to makes it well worth the investment of time. So the good news about some of these statistics is these are all things we can do something about. 
So um, even though we may feel like we're talking about FAFSA until we're blue in the face, the reality is that some students are still out there not understanding um, what it is, how to complete it, and how important it is to making college more affordable. And um, students from low-income households who can most benefit are often the least likely to complete it. So you can, as you're prioritizing your resources and your partners, that's one place to look. That's why in North Carolina, we have um, partnered with various organizations to create two powerful tools that you and the community can use to help students in, com in uh, completing this important step. So the NC FAFSA tracker is one. As I said, that was created by the nonprofit My Future NC and is now currently publicly available on the CFNC website. And the second one is the Finish the FAFSA tool, which is a secure report administered by SEAA. It's available to education professionals like you who work uh, in school districts directly with high school seniors on their FAFSA completion. So let's start by talking about the FAFSA tracker. This is the new look and feel to it. It looks a little different than when it was on My Future MC, but hopefully you like the clean, easy to read look of it. Um, as you'll see at the very top, we're including a state completion rate. So you can see how your school is doing relative to the state. This is publicly available FAFSA completion data. It's in a dashboard format, so you'll see the tables. It displays submission and completion by school and district. Um, and uh, this year versus last year. So you can see how you're doing relative to last year. And at least on the first tab, which is for public schools, you'll see the senior class count and you'll also see the completion rate. So you can see the, the count, the senior class size that was used to calculate that rate. Now it's updated each week on Monday and your principal superintendent and other education stakeholders can check on how fast the completion is going at your school and district each week. They can also look at performance across the district to deploy extra resources and support where it's needed. And um, I'm always encouraging if, if there's a, a rival school in the next town over that you have a little friendly competition with, you can also check to see how they're doing and, and see, um, see if maybe you either need to step up your game or you can you know, get pretty excited that you're beating them in, in the FAFSA. All friendly competition, of course. I used to see Miami, Dade and Broward County kind of, um, they, were, they were peer sister counties in Florida and they would often um, you know, be curious to see how each other was doing. Okay, so there are three easy ways to find the FAFSA tracker. First, you can just use the shortened URL cfnc.org forward slash FAFSA tracker. The second way is at the top of CMC, CFNC, sorry, we have now added FAFSA tools. So if you click on that, that will take you to the sorter page and you can click on the community leader box and that will take you straight to the FAFSA. And the third way is you can also click on the education professional section that may be where you go for some of your other tools. The very first box you'll see uh, now is the FAFSA tools and you can um, get to the tracker from there. Okay, so one of the cool things you can see now that is different than the, the former tracker is you can select your district from the drop down and um, see all of your schools at a glance. So you can see them in one screen and kind of see how your school is doing relative to your district. So um, we're excited to bring that to our users because that was something we were definitely seeing a need for. One of the things you may note is that the district total is not just the sum of the schools. That's because on that first page, cooperative innovative high schools are not on that page. I'll talk more about that in a minute, um, but they are included in the district total. So um, if you're a math whiz and, and you're eyeballing that and seeing the difference, that's that's why. The other cool thing you can do is you can um, download a snapshot or a PDF. So if you are taking a snapshot of your schools and or your district, you can download that and either share it with folks or you can include it in a presentation like this. 
Um, the other cool thing you can do is you can sort by any column. So if you wanted to bring up all the schools in your district and sort by completion rate, for instance, you'd start by selecting the district from the drop down. And then if you hover over to the right of the column header, if you hover over there and click, that will resort that column. Uh, I think it starts by highest to lowest. I think if you click on it again, it'll reverse order, but it starts from highest to lowest. So in this example, you can see the schools that had the highest completion rate for this particular county are now at the top. You can also do that for any of the other columns. So if you wanna see the largest schools and how they're doing relative to each other, that's another way you can use that, that feature. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, the main tracker pages for public and charter schools, cooperative, innovative high schools, and private schools have their own tabs. Um, we And the, the reason for that is we don't have senior class counts for private schools, which is why they are not on the main page um, where completion rate is included. And then um, for the cooperative, innovative high schools, they have unique senior classes that don't universally include all 12th or and or all 13th grader across all the CIHS schools that can lead to overcounting or undercounting if we're including them in the completion rates. So that's why we set up their own tab. And um, in both cases, you can calculate your own rate, which we'll talk about in a minute if you're not familiar with that. Um, but you'll still see the table of submitted and completed this year versus last year. So you can see how you're how you're doing and um, whether your num numbers are up or down. When we talk about the FAFSA completion rate, what we're talking about is the percent of seniors who have completed a FAFSA relative to the total senior class. So this percentage or rate is calculated by dividing the number of the school seniors who completed the FAFSA by the total senior class for instance, if you had a school with 69 seniors, 36 of them completed a FAFSA, you would take 36 divided by 69 or 52%. Um, so particularly for those CIHS or the private schools, that's how you'd go about it. If you're in a high school where your class size has changed a lot, and so the completion rate that's posted doesn't really reflect where your numbers are now, you can use the same calculation. If you scroll down the same page, Further down, you're going to see frequently asked questions. Most often, this is related to data questions. So you'll, you'll see some questions around that. Each of these are accordion. So if you click on them, they open up with the answers. Um, but the important thing to know is that the data for the tracker comes from two main sources. The federal student aid provides the FAFSA completion information by school. And then DPI, the principal um, month report, Principal's month report, month two, that's a mouthful, provides the senior class counts from the end of October. Typically, senior class counts aren't changing too much after that, which is why we use that report. Um, the data is updated every week on Mondays from mid-October until the end of the year. Uh, we keep the senior class count the same, just so the rate isn't wobbling all over um, across the year. So we'll, again, we'll talk more about, you know, if you want to keep track of your own, how to go about doing that. But the other thing to keep in mind is we are keeping a running list of enhancements we'd like to add. So if you see something that you'd like to see, please send those over to FAFSA tracker at ncseaa.edu. That email address is at the bottom of the NC tracker page. So if you didn't get that, no worries. It's at the bottom of the page. You can see it. Um, I can't guarantee you we can add every enhancement, but we will certainly consider the, the ones that come through and see if we can make them happen. And then if uh, finally, if you're looking for inspiration, my future NC back in 2022 recognized six schools for their innovative practices across the state. So, you know, you're kind of looking for a little inspiration late in the year, that would be a good place to go. So just super quick, the FAFSA tracker is publicly available. School leadership can monitor their progress. I just, I'm just checking in to see if there's any questions. I'm not seeing anything. So it looks like we are okay to keep moving. All right, good. Um, okay, so now let's talk about the finish the FAFSA report. This is for professionals like you that work directly with seniors. 
um, I'm moving the needle. You can work, you can get specific information about the students at your school. The first thing to keep in mind is the finish the FAFSA access is restricted. It's governed by a policy that's dictated by the federal government. It's limited to school counselors and college access um, partners that work directly with high school seniors on, FAF on completing their FAFSA. The school you work with must be a public or a charter high school in order to gain access. I know we've got a private school user on the call today. You don't currently have access to this report, but we are working on a process. So we're hoping to make this available to you uh, going into next school year. So stay tuned on that. Um, and then finally, NCSEAA signed an agreement with the federal government and then in turn signed data, data use agreements with the public school districts and the uh, charter schools. And that's what governs how we use this data and how it needs to be protected. And so as part of gaining access as an authorized user, you're obligated to abide by those privacy and security um, concerns. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute. If you don't already have access to finish the FAFSA, uh, there's three steps to take. First, you need a CFNC account that is using your school email address. Um, then you submit a request for a Pro Tools account. I've put in the URL, but that's also, if you if you go to the Pro Tools help page, you'll see the link there. And then you can request finish the FAFSA access, and this is the, the link to that as well. Alternatively, we are really trying to work with our school districts to update all the authorized users in their district. So if you are a district leader or <clears throat> if you work, <clears throat> excuse me, if you work with your district leader, they can reach out to us at outreach at ncseaa.edu for more information. <clears throat> Pardon me on how to do that. Any questions there, Catherine, that I need to get to? Uh, Dr. Gregory, yeah. 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 There, there is a question about the senior count. I think it relates to the tracker, but maybe a real quick comparison of those senior counts. Yeah, great. Um, so just a bit, so the question that came through is um, the baseline count is based on the first month. It's the second month actually. So it's October, um, which will not change for mid-year graduates. We do get an updated DPI file in January for finish the FAFSA, but for the FAFSA tracker, we use the month two report. So the October, the last day, membership last day in October, that becomes the fixed baseline for um, for the the tracker. So great question. Okay, so I mentioned a little bit about privacy and data security. Please keep in mind um, this is considered secure information by the feds. I know many of you see, see even more sensitive information, but we are required to follow that policy. So as an authorized user, you're expected to protect it. Um, keep in mind, there's no income or social security information that's visible on this report. You um, are expected to use it only for its intended purpose, which is helping seniors on FAFSA completion. And then um, education professionals with finished FAFSA access should not be sharing it with anyone other than what's allowed by law, which is if, it's, if the student is younger than 18, um, that's the student, the parents, or a person the parent designates. Uh, if the student is older than 18, then it's the student or somebody that the student designates or as required by law. So that's who you're allowed to share it with. For those of you who have College Advising Corps folks in your schools, we do have a data sharing agreement with them. So they are allowed to see this data because they work directly with um, seniors. And uh, can we drop the links in? Yes, I think Catherine can handle that if you're uh, if you're able. That would be great. Um, okay, so let's talk about accessing finish the FAFSA within Pro Tools on CFNC. Once your account is all set up with finish the FAFSA access, you start by logging into the CFNC site, which is in the upper right hand corner. Um, then you select education professionals. They have it in my dashboard, but I usually, if you look at the very 
top nav up here, you can see there's education professionals up there. That's how I usually go in. You can click on that and then you will see a access pro tools um, button and uh, you click on that and that will take you to the reports or within pro tools. So once you're in pro tools along the left rail, you're going to see, a, you know, several things. So students and groups, career reports, et cetera. You're going to see college reports. And if you click on college reports, again, it'll open like an accordion and finish the FAFSA should be one of the reports. If you have access, should be one of the reports that you'll see in there. If you don't have access, you won't see it show up. If you're not familiar with some of these college reports, you're going to see some other great tools in there like college applications, RDS completion, and transcript tracking so you can have an idea of monitoring how your students are progressing through the college going process. So this is what the Finish the FAFSA report looks like. And um, once you have access, this is typically what you will see. So you're going to see first the student's name, and then you're going to see a status column of not submit not submitted, submitted, or completed. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what that means in a minute. Um, and then a missing signature is a major reason for FAFSA that is submitted but not completed. So the next column you're gonna see is signed by student and it'll either be blank because they haven't submitted it or it'll be yes or no because they um, completed it. Yes, we see the signature or no, we don't. Um, the, the next column is whether the signature is there for the parent. Sometimes you may see uh, that it, it's a no, so it's missing a signature. That can be, if it's not always, but it can be if you're working with families whose parents are undocumented, or maybe they're just having trouble using the, the FSA ID or the FAFSA system, so they have printed out or you've printed out with them the signature page, you've sent that into the feds. It takes a while for that paper signature page to get matched up with the student record. So in the meantime, signed by parent will show as no, as if it's missing, but we're just waiting for that process to complete. So hopefully those are easy, easy problems to address. The next column is whether the student has been selected for verification, which again, we'll talk more about in a minute. And then the final data point is an error code. And if you hover over the error code, you'll get a pop-up window. It might look a little different than how it looks. I think when I've seen it, it, it kind of pops up in that light green area um, that will tell you what is of concern that the student, like the next steps that the student needs to take. Okay, so I am a big fan of using data to get better data. So you can download your Finish the FAFSA report to an Excel spreadsheet where you can sort it and prioritize it. You know, if you have a large senior class, this will make it easier on you. For instance, you can sort by the current status field so that you, you know, maybe one week you're focusing on those students who haven't even started their FAFSAs. You can um, invite them to a completion event that you're having or that might be at the community college so that um, they can get that process going. Next, you may look to those that have um, started but not completed their FAFSA to see if they're missing a signature or, an, or if there's an error that needs to be corrected. And then next, you can sort to see if you have students who are flagged for verification and just encourage them to finish that process with their financial aid institution. So with this, you can keep track locally, excuse me, on how your students are progressing, even ahead of, you know, some of the federal data that, um, that gets updated. So you are the closest to the student. You may have seen them complete the FAFSA. It may not show up in your report. It, if they completed it today, it's definitely not going to show up today or tomorrow probably by the next, the following day, you'll see it. But there might be errors that could take a little longer. So you can keep track in your own spreadsheet how students are progressing. If you have students that opted out of sharing their information, that's another reason to keep track of it locally. Again, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but the, the FSA system will um, share what 
they are showing in their system on any given day that that report is run, but you may have more real-time information because you're working directly with students. So I'm a big fan of keeping track of your own data. Um, just you know, keep in mind the privacy and, and security obligations that go with downloading and, and potentially printing it out. If you're downloading files, they need to be stored securely and um, you should delete them from your system when the work is com uh, concluded. And if you printed copies, you need to make sure you're not leaving them out in an unsecure way or that they are visible to people who shouldn't be seeing them. The other important thing to know is the system does reset on July 30th when all of the data is purged. So if you're tracking your progress, I know this is particularly true for some of our college access partners that have access, um, if you need, you know, kind of summary data that you're going to use for grant reporting purposes, for instance, or if our schools are applying for a Title IV grant, you know, and you need to get that data, you need to get it out of there before the end of July. The system will reset and then you won't see anything in it for August and September into mid-October with the likely delay of FAFSA next year. You probably won't see anything in there until you know, mid-December, depending on, on when they finally um, open up the new FAFSA. Okay, so I talked a little bit about the FAFSA status that you're going to see in that finished the FAFSA report. The first is not submitted, and this can mean a few things. It could mean they're eligible to submit a, a FAFSA, but they just haven't done it. Um, they just haven't started. It could mean that they're not eligible. So for instance, if they're not a US citizen, they might not be eligible to complete a FAFSA. Or it could be that they have another plan. They, they may be planning to go into the military or maybe they're planning to go directly into the workforce, in which case completing a FAFSA um, isn't necessary. I have seen it happen where plans change. Jessica Beal was on our, our webinar a few weeks ago talking about how she had three military students who were planning to go into the military Two got um, had um, sports injuries that disqualified them. The third had a health injury, uh, a health issue that kept them from going into the military. And so all three had to pivot and ended up going to their community college. And because they had already completed a FAFSA, they were able to do that really smoothly. So you never know. I mean, I I, I don't necessarily want to make people fill out a form that they don't need, but plans do change. So you can always encourage them if they want to. Okay, submitted means um, they have submitted the form, but it's either missing information, there's errors, or they've been flagged for verification. So if it's submitted but not completed, they're not currently being considered for financial aid. So their, their application is just kind of floating out there. Um, once it's completed, now they're being considered for financial aid and they should start receiving information um, and notifications of their student aid report, financial aid award letters. They now also have the opportunity to appeal for professional judgment if something significant has changed in their financial situation. Okay, a word about verification for those who are not familiar with it. Um, this is a process it's, it's like the auditing process for tax returns. It's a similar function. The financial aid institution where the student plans to go is required to collect documents that verify some of the financial information that a student has included in their FAFSA. <clears throat> it, um, it's randomly done. We've been on hold because of the pandemic, but I believe in May it starts up again, if I'm remembering correctly. And in prior years, we've seen verification of anywhere from 17 to over 30 percent. So it, it's not an it could be, you know, one in four of your students getting flagged. Um, the best way to lower someone's chances of being selected for verification is to use the IRS data retrieval tool or IRS DRT. That pulls information directly from their tax returns. So it, it removes the chance of errors, at least in that part of the information, because it's pulling the information directly. 
Um, and in doing that, it reduces their chances of getting flagged for verification. It can still happen, but it's less likely. The important thing is to um, reassure your student and the family that they didn't do anything wrong. This is just you know, one of those auditing functions to make sure we're using taxpayer dollars effectively. Students and parents just need to provide documentation to their financial aid office um, where they're planning to attend. That, that aid office will let them know what they need to turn in. Here's the important thing you need to know more than anything when it comes to verification. 71%, uh, NCAN did a study a couple of years ago, 71% of students who, who were verified through the verification process saw no change in their Pell Grant award. So it's, you know, that, that says, keep trucking. Like it, you know, you just need to get the documentation in, but most likely you are, um, your Pell Grant won't, award won't change. So get it in so that you can make sure you get access to that. Um, that 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 funding. Okay, so just summarizing really quick, I'm finished the FAFSA, the four main ways you can use it to help in targeted outreach with your um, students directly is A, identify the students who haven't even started a FAFSA. Next, move those who have submitted but not completed. So what's outstanding, help them figure out what that is and um, help them get across the finish line. The, whoops, sorry. The third way is to alert them to any errors that may be showing up and what to do in that case. Again, you don't have to become a financial aid expert. The information's in there, the steps the student should take. And finally, just encourage students to complete the verification process. Okay, so we are gonna do another check-in with you all. Let me just check on questions. Um, polls. So, we're testing your knowledge here. First one, which tool should you use to work one-to-one -one with students on completing their FAFSA? Right, right out of the gate, y'all are getting it. Any other votes? Okay, good. Okay, very good. Can't fool you all. So that's right. Finish the FAFSA is the tool where you work one-on-one -on -one with students. I know some of the names are a little confusing. So, okay, great job. Let's do the next one. Which tool should you use to see FAFSA completion rates for your schools and your districts? Okay, good job. There's no fool on you on this one. Perhaps a tracker, that's right. Um, and let's do another one. Okay, so what is the most common mistake that's made on a FAFSA? Is it verification, a calculation error? Oops, I have an extra choice in there, sorry. It's not choice three, and then missing signature. Okay, that's, you are right. Let's share results. Missing signature is the number one common mistake that students make. So um, luckily that's an easy thing to solve. So, um, you know, we're that that's one you can use the finish the FAFSA tool to uncover. All right. Let's see. Um, yeah, let's do this one. What is the best way for a student to lower their chances of being selected for verification? Is it the fill out the paper form, have their parent fill out the FAFSA, or use the IRS data retrieval tool. Okay, no fooling you. Yes, the IRS data retrieval tool is the best way to lower your chances of um, getting selected for verification. Great job. 
Okay. And then let's do this one. So as given that the finish the FAFSA is restricted, you as an authorized user are required to do what? Do not share the information with unauthorized users, delete and destroy downloaded forms, and downloaded data must be stored securely. Or all of the above. Okay, good. Excellent. All of the above. So we just need to be careful with who's got eyes on those forms. Okay, so let's move on. Um, great job, everyone. Very, very briefly, the FAFSA tracker is available to all. It's not restricted. You can track completion rates for schools and districts, and it's used by your, dis your school and district leadership, as well as your community partners, and just keeping a pulse. The second tool, uh, Finish the FAFSA, does have restricted access because you can see student level information that allows you to work one on one with your students. You can guide students to correct their errors and you can provide extra support to students who need it. Okay, so next up, we're gonna talk a little bit about data because that's the thing I tend to get asked about more than anything. <clears throat> I want you to know a little bit about what, you don't have to become a data expert, but I just think it helps to know a little bit about what's included and what's not. If you're ever confused, just let us know and, and we'll see if we can clear it up. As I shared, use data to get better data. So we get information from the feds, but you at the school have the best data of all because you are closest to the students. So the important thing to know is a lot of times the difference between the two tools, because we get asked about that, is um, it's just a timing issue because the, the data gets updated on a different cadence. So for instance, finish the FAPS, it gets updated every business day, whereas the tracker gets updated once a week and that's on every Monday. So if you're seeing difference between the two tools, a lot of times that's a big part of it. The um, data parameters you need to know for both tools. FSA has this massive data set of all the people who complete a FAFSA. They have to decide in order to share this information with us who's considered a high school senior in terms of sending this information out to us. So they define a high school senior as somebody who's 19 years old or younger. They're a first time FAFSA filer and they will be receiving their high school diploma by the start of the school year to which they're applying for aid. So right now students are applying for aid for the fall. That means they're expecting to get a high school diploma anytime between last December and August. Um, this has implications for you. So if you serve a lot of students who are 20 and older, which, which can be the case if you're working in an alternative program, your students may not show up on this report, either reports actually. If your students completed a FAFSA before, they won't show up in the report. I have had some well-meaning counselors who, who you know, didn't know the implication of this, um, and they were encouraging their juniors to complete a FAFSA for practice. But if you do that, the students then are not no longer considered a first time filer when they become a senior, so they won't show up in your report. So if you want to have uh, your students get practice completing the FAFSA, FSA does make a FAFSA demo site available. Um, hopefully Catherine can drop that into the chat, but I'll definitely include it in the email we send out with the slides and the recording later. You can have students practice on that. Um, but the one ca caveat I would say to that is the FAFSA is changing a lot going into next year. So for juniors, it's it, you could have them do it, but it's changing a lot. So I'm not sure I would do that this year, but going into next year, that, that could be helpful. Okay. This is another biggie I want to make sure you all know, especially those of you who are working with early students who are earning a lot of early college credit. And by that, I mean AP, IB, dual enrollment. Um, there is a question on the form. I've taken a screen grab from the print form so you know what it looks like, but most of you are doing the, the digital form. 
In the print form, it's question 26, and it asks, what will your college grade level be when you begin the 23-24 school year? The mistake sometimes that students make who are getting early college credit is they answer with the second option, which is attended college before and first year undergraduate. The problem with that is um, they're no longer considered a senior who's working towards earning a diploma, so they won't be included in your data. Um, and it, it there's a chance it could impact some of their Pell, uh, not their Pell, but their overall financial aid award. So the most important thing is for them to include that very first one, the never attended college and first year undergraduate. That's the pro tip here. Um, make sure they, they select that on question 26. It may be a different number next year, so don't always count on it being 26, but that's what it is this year. Okay, so important things for you to know in terms of common data errors or omissions from the finish the FAFSA report. Um, the common question I get asked is students claim that they completed the FAFSA, but they're not showing up in the completed um, as completed in the finish the FAFSA report. There's several common culprits here to keep in mind. If the student spelled their name slightly differently on the FAFSA form than how it appears in their DPI record, there's gonna be a delay in matching because it's not gonna be automated. So it's gonna move to a, a manual matching process, which usually can take a few days to, to catch that. So if you're doing a FAFSA completion event tonight, if you were to look on Monday and they're not there, it's probably, they might've, like if they have a hyphenated last name and they left the hyphen off, it that might it might not match. Um, the next thing is students sometimes complete the wrong year. I, I had somebody reach out to me recently. They had two students who weren't showing up. When we went and investigated, we realized they completed the wrong year. They completed last year's. So those um, who are in college now, that FAFSA is still available. They completed that year. So not only do they have to now complete the correct year, but they won't show up in your data because they're not a first time filer anymore. These types of things don't happen a lot, but they can happen. So I just want you to um, know about that. And the other thing to keep in mind is um, at the beginning of the year, your parents are required to complete several FERPA questions. Um, if they select no, for the first question, which means they're opting out of sharing their information, one of the impacts of that is you will not get finished the FAFSA access for them. One way you can tell that is if you go in the finish the FAFSA report and you are not seeing the student's name at all, most likely uh, they've opted out. It's because the parents have opted out of sharing their information because you won't see the name if they've opted out. And the last thing, again, doesn't happen a lot, but just letting you know, um, transfer students, we get the DPI file with all the students in your class in October. So if they transfer in after that report, they won't show up in your report. Now we do get an updated file in late January to early February. So sometimes we can pick it up then. But again, if you get somebody transferring in after that file, again, they, they won't show up. None of that is to worry too much about it. It's part of why I encourage you to use data to get better data. Um, you can keep track of your folks, even if some of these errors have been made or, or omissions have been made. You can still keep track of them in your own spreadsheet so that you know who's in good shape, who still needs help. Okay, and then data parameters for the FAFSA tracker. The most common questions I get asked for that is why is my school missing? And the um, it if it's a new school, it can take up to a year before it starts showing up in the FSA file. And so we can't display it until FSA gives it to us. The other main reason is if you have less than five FAFSA submissions, the data is suppressed for privacy reasons. That's an FSA rule. So we won't show, uh, you won't be showing in the tracker until five, you hit the five submissions mark and then you will appear. Um, 
And then why is the rate different than what I have? Good for you for having your own rate. I'm excited about that. Um, again, the, the main reason is when it comes to the tracker, we keep the senior class list the same all year so that it's not the rate's not bouncing around from week to week. Um, we take that senior class from DPI principal monthly report month two, so end of October, and then that becomes the class rate for the class count for the rest of the, the year. If you happen to have larger changes to your senior class, again, doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. That's when that's where you're going to want to keep track of your own rate and keep your own education stakeholders informed. This, um, so I'll give you an example. When I was in Florida back in 2017, I think it was, is when Hurricane uh, Irma hit, and I'm sorry, Hurricane Maria hit, that hit Puerto Rico. We got a whole big influx of students coming from the island to the state in order to be able to finish out the year. So Central Florida got a lot of students added to their high schools and high school counts. So their numbers were all, all kind of weird. Um, because of that. So we just kept track of, of their completion rates locally. Um, the good news is, is in the new tracker, we're actually displaying the new senior class total. So you'll know what the number is that we're using. And so you can see if you're, you know, if you have a small class, but it's changed by five students, that can be a lot for your student class. So that way, you know, okay, I just need to calculate my own rate. Okay, so we are going to do a couple more polls to test on um, what you're learning here. Let's see. Okay, so how often is the NC tracker updated? Is it every business day, every other day? Is it weekly or is it monthly? <clears throat> We have almost everyone. Okay, good. Okay, so weekly is correct. The tracker gets updated every week on Mondays. Now, let's see how often Finish the FAFSA is updated. Again, is it every business day, every other day, weekly or monthly? We got one or two more folks who haven't voted. Are you not sure? Okay, good. That's right. Every business day is when Finish the FAFSA report is updated. So Finish the FAFSA is the more, the closer real-time um, data versus the tracker, which is weekly. Again, you have the most up-to-date data, but between the two tools, Finish the FAFSA has um, more real-time data. Okay, and then I think we've got one more here. Yeah, so why, what are the reason or reasons that students aren't showing completed on Finish the FAFSA report? Is it the student identifier, the FERPA question, students completing the wrong year, or maybe they're a transfer student? <clears throat> got a couple more people who haven't voted. There we go. Okay, good. You are right, all of the above. So there's a few different reasons why students might not show up in the report. It's nothing to get too worked up about. Those are just kind of the common reasons. Um, the FERPA opt-out is typically the biggest one, and even that one is a small number relative to all our students, but, but there are few, a, a few where that's the case. Um, student identifier information not matching, they will show up at some point with that one. It's just a timing delay. But the other ones, if they've completed the wrong year, you're not going to see them in the report. Okay, great job, everyone. As we're wrapping up here, I'm just reminding you all, if you haven't, if you aren't already connected to your CFNC representatives, I encourage you to do that. These folks are such a wealth of information and resources on the entire 
college going process, but certainly on how to pay in particular, um, they just, I, I learned something every time I talk to them. If you have a large Spanish speaking population, tap into the Spanish services team as well. They're amazing. Um, quick reminders on where students can go for more support. Um, we have all kinds of resources and information under the pay section on CFNC. We have also recorded the walk through the FAFSA and that is there so they can be playing it in real time as they're completing the FAFSA in case they're confused. Remember the one, one of the things that I love about North Carolina is students can get help from any college or university in the region. It does not need to be the one they're planning to attend. So on the CFNC website, there is a financial assistance map which shows folks the, the closest college or university to your location. So if they have a question, they're feeling stuck, they can go straight into that office, folks will help them. Um, you can also take advantage of the studentaid.gov help center. This is particularly helpful if you have parents who need assistance in a language other than English. They have, I don't even know how many languages they cover, but a lot. Um, so that's a great resource. And then finally, there are short videos uh, in the pay section of the CFNC website that can help with, you know, particular sticking points that tend to be common areas that confuse folks. So take advantage of that. Um, here's the important thing. So as many of you know, the uh, FAFSA is changing a lot going into next year. We are thrilled to welcome Morley Keller from the National College Attainment Network. She's gonna be joining us on May 17th from nine to 11 with what you need to know about the FAFSA simplification in terms of what we know by May. Um, that re uh, registration link isn't live yet, but I'm going to shoot for trying to get that live by next week so you can register. And um, so, but in the meantime, save the date, May 17th to uh, the 9 to 11. And that's our contact information. So if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us at outreach at NCSEAA. Catherine, are there any questions before we wrap up? Well, there was a question about the FAFSA changes, so thank you for promoting that upcoming webinar. Uh, maybe uh, mention where the registration link will be, just that way yeah. folks can connect to that. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, we will send it out via email to, if you're already on our email list, we will also put it on under the education professional section. There is a page for professional development opportunities. That's where we put things like this webinar and any other webinar that we create specifically for counselors and, and college access folks, it will be on that page as well. So you can check back, you know, probably late next week um, and look for it there. And Kathy, if a counselor is not connected to the emails that you're sending out, what should they do or who should they reach out to? Yeah, just if you email us at that outreach at ncsea.edu and let us know you want to get added to that list, just um, email us there and we will put you on the list. There you go. I don't think there are any other questions out there. Okay. Well, very good. So just, uh, you know, wrapping up here, FAFSA gets a bad rap as being difficult to fill out. As you saw, 9% of our students are confused and think that um, it's too hard. Uh, in my own household, that happens, so it happens to the best of us. Um, but what we've seen is when, stu when students and parents pull their information together, you can get it done in as little as 20 to 30 minutes. So given the amount of money that it opens up access to, it's well worth the time investment. So with that, I am going to give you uh, about a minute of your hour back. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're thrilled to have you here. And if you have any further questions, let us know. Have a great day, everyone.